Happy almost Thanksgiving. We're so glad you're with us today. So, June 8th, 2017. At the time, my wife Courtney, she was working a retail job, and it was in the evening sometimes. She wasn't at the house. And it was about, I don't know, 7 30, 8 o'clock at night, something like that. And I started feeling just this little discomfort, you know? And I'm like, what is that? You know, maybe it's something I ate, you know? Just a little bit, so I sat up a little bit. Okay, maybe it's okay. About 10 minutes later, I felt it kind of, another wave came through, just another little discomfort, a little stronger this time, you know, but it wasn't horrible, right? Just a little bit more discomfort, and some of you probably already know where I'm going with this, especially if you've lived here for a while. And then about 20 minutes after that first little initial discomfort, all, remember, anybody seen Temple of Doom in the end of Jones? The guy reaches in, right? It's like somebody came in, and they reached in, and they squeezed my innards, and then they twisted as hard as they could, and all of a sudden, boom, I was on the floor, just writhing in. I was like, what in the world? I've never felt anything like this before. Uh, my daughter and son were home. She came in the room and said, Dad, are you okay? I said, I need to go to the ER, right? And so, and so she's freaking out. She's like, oh, my goodness, you know. And so at that time, Pastor Matt lived right down the road. I said, hey, man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I said. I, I think I tried to be calm, you know, so I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be any panic or anything. I said, can you take me to the emergency room? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, you know. So he comes and comes gets me. And apparently it was what? What do you think it was? The Carolina crud, no, but it's close because the kidney stone is the Carolina crud. It is the ultimate Carolina crud. And apparently, the southeastern United States is known as the kidney stone belt, right? And if you don't know this already, the North Carolina is like the buckle, right? It's the buckle of that kidney stone belt. And apparently, this area this we live in right now, this Piedmont area, is like the ultra center. I mean, have you, if you drove up in Raleigh any time, like on, I think it's Capitol Boulevard, you'll see the big sign, Kidney Stone Center, right? I mean, so this is like the ultimate place for kidney stones. You know, they don't put that on the sign, you know, City of Oak, City of Kidney Stone. For some reason, they don't do that there, right? But so we have that. So if you're new to this area, welcome and drink plenty of filtered water. Filtered water, because, hey, it could be in the tap water. We don't know. I mean, our tap water turns everything like orange and brown and stuff like that. So anyway, so welcome. But what, is, so, what does that have to do with us this morning? All right, so we've been in this series called um, Into the Wilderness for the past few weeks, right? And in week one, we open up about speaking um, certain testing that takes place in the wilderness. And we looked at the, uh, the story of Jesus and how he was tested and how we can take that story and apply it to our own lives. And then from there, we talked about the art of having patience in the wilderness, learning that often God provides wisdom when we wait. And then last week, we honed on listening when we were in the season of wilderness. We have to learn to discern how and where God speaks to us and to most clearly hear and sense his leading, to have those quiet moments with God, to learn how to be quiet, right, for just a moment and actually listen to him, you know, have those alone time moments with him. And so today we are talking about the pain. We're talking about the pain that happens sometimes in the wilderness. And we're not just really talking about the physical pain, but also that emotional pain, right? It's so intense that it almost causes this physical pain in your lives. You know, you're crying so hard, you're in the shower, you're hyperventilating, you, know, you can't breathe, that gut-wrenching heartache. It's that, that physical reaction that can come to this pain. You know, like when your high school sweetheart, she breaks up with you after you get one of these together, right? Anybody have those matching airbrush shirts? You got it at the mall or the, the county fair, you know, and y'all went from holding hands like this to holding hands like this. You know, it was getting really serious, you know? <laughs> And so you, you broke up with you, and you're sitting in your parents' driveway crying while you're listening to I'll Be There For You by Bon Jovi, right? Because that's what you danced with her, you know, in the, at the prom, right? You did that little circle slow dance, right? Leaving room for the Holy Spirit, you know, and all that stuff, right? I mean, it's like, how could she? We were practically married. We've been together for three months. How could she do this to me? You know, just sobbing, you know? But in all seriousness, though, Pain is something the Bible speaks about as a present thing in our lives on this earth. Heartache is real. 
Emotional trauma is real. Days when you have no desire, you might have no motivation just to get out of your bed. It's all real. But there's good news. And the good news is that the Bible, Bible also makes it clear that for those who put their trust in Jesus, pain is not something that will last for an eternity. So, turn to your Bibles or open up your favorite Bible app. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. I'd like to welcome, if you're watching online, welcome. We're so glad you're joining us with, there, uh, with us today. We're going to start, we're going to take a minute and I'm going to remind ourselves of the hope that awaits those who have put their trust in Jesus. So Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the ESV if you'd like to sync up. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And right there is our first hidden gem. Because the people that, that were living during the time this was written, the sea was this dangerous and this unpredictable and this really chaotic place. If you look back at chapter 20 of Revelation, we read that is the home of the dead. Even further back, chapter 11 is associated with the abyss from which the beast comes. So it's just, just really, you know, they, they have, there's a lot of fear. And even the fishermen, you know, they, the experienced fishermen, they were out with Jesus on the boat. They were afraid too. So it's associated with that. So when John writes this about the sea and how the sea was no more, it was comforting to the readers. He is saying that there will be nothing to harm or cause God's people to fear. No chaos, no death, or no evil. Everything will be created new. Moving on to verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, an indication that something important, important words are coming. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And see, this is a throwback to the Old Testament, for the word dwelling literally means tent, as in the tabernacle that they had in the wilderness back then. And he says, He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Amen. Isn't that just wonderful hope for us this morning? You see, the disappearance of death and sorrow and crying and pain, it represents a total reversal from the curses that we find in Genesis chapter 3. But obviously, we are still here, right? We're still here on this earth. And even if we're doing the right things, even if we're doing those self-sacrificial uh, self things, sorry, I stumble over my words sometimes, self-sacrificial things, like you're going down the road, and you see, you saw it five miles down, you know, before, that the lane was closed, and then this guy's still speeding up. You're like, I know he saw it too, right? And so, but you decide, I'm just going to be nice today. I'm going to let him in, you know. Right, But even if we do those kinds of things, we may still experience pain in this life. And so that is where we are going to pick up the story of the life of Joseph. So now we're going to turn to Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 37, starting in verse 12. Genesis 37, verse 12. In this story, many of you probably heard this story many times. But Joseph has just told his family about a series of dreams he had, both of which seem to showcase them bowing to him on some occasion in the future. Now, Joseph was the second youngest of 12 brothers. Second youngest. So right there is a problem. Who has an older sibling, right? That's a problem right there. I mean, I have an older sister right here. I think we, yes, there we are. I'm the one on the left, and there's my sister. And you can tell by the brown panel walls that, you know, <laughs> I think we have, who else had those brown panel walls in their house, right? I think we have those in every single house we grew up in. But if I went, when I was 17 years old, if I went up and told my sister, hey, I had a dream last night that, you know, a few years from now, you're going to be bowing down to me. You know, my sister, she's not a violent person. She's really not. She's very, but she has this look that she can get on her face, you know where she can tell me with just that expression is like, no, nah. you know, you're, <laughs> there's no way that was just a dream and that no way it was going. So he had that going against him. Also, he was favored 
by his father Jacob. So you can imagine how his brothers felt. They were full of jealousy, and that jealousy led to anger. Anger led to hate, you know, all that stuff. So when Joseph goes to hang out with his brothers soon after, here's what the Bible tells us. Start Genesis 37, verse 12. He says, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, Well, here I am. So he's ready to go. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now, this is probably 60 miles he had to travel, 60 miles north. And a man found him wandering in the fields. Why? Because they weren't there. So he was like looking around like, dude, they told me they were going to be here, right? So he was wandering around. And the man asked me, he said, what are you seeking? He said, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So another 17 miles approximately for him to travel. Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, man, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what, what, how, will, what will become of his dreams. You can almost hear the <laughs> kind of laugh after they said that. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit over here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might, and so that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. See, Reuben was the firstborn, and he looked after his father's interests, and he knew the sorrow Joseph's death would bring to Jacob. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him in the pit. The pit was empty, with no, there was no water in it. And then they sat down to eat. Now, how cold is that? They're like, all right, here we go. Okay, cool, let's go eat. Y'all hungry? You know, I mean, really. they talking about they just have complete, you know, just, they just so cold to him. So, when looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? So let's, let's make some money off this guy, okay? So come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and, the bro and his brothers listen to him. I mean, what a sequence of events. Joseph gets sold into slavery in Egypt, and so his life takes a turn for the worst. Now, there are a lot of different things we could pull out of the story of Joseph related to suffering and pain. But here's the first one I think comes directly from this passage we just read. It's this. Oftentimes our pain is caused by someone else. Sometimes it's not because of our mistakes. It's something that somebody else did to us. You know, in this story, we clearly see that Joseph's brothers are scheming with one another, trying to find a way to get rid of him. And after deciding not to kill him, they decide to sell him. So the point is this, this that Joseph experienced this initial pain without having any control over it. His pain came at the expense of others' anger and jealousy. The New Testament, we also see this with the Apostle Paul. He was constantly being beaten, imprisoned, and attacked by his own people and the Gentiles. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is going to give us this list of some of the things that he has gone through. Now, this is from the message translation. He says, I have worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count. And at death's door, time after time, I've been flogged five times with the Jews, 39 lashes, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times and immersed in the open sea for a night and day and hard traveling year in and year out. I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storm, and betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. Paul knew earthly suffering. But we will see later, he also knows the joy of the Lord. 
So maybe someone here today has experienced some pain, or maybe you have in your past, and maybe it wasn't brought upon you um, by your own volition. Maybe it was a decision that someone else made. You know, maybe something happened in your family, and you don't really know how to receive love or express love to others. Maybe you were fired from a job, and it's you have this just this nagging feeling that it, was, that it was because somebody said something behind the scenes and you had nothing to do with it, and you're not sure what was going on. Maybe somebody spread lies about you, you know. Maybe you feel betrayed from someone that used to be a good friend, and you're still not feeling that forgiveness that you know. It's like, God, please help me forgive this person. But you still feel hurt by this. Or maybe some, even worse, somebody who hurt your spouse, right? Like, oh, you can come after me, but don't you dare hurt her or him, right? Then you really get, you know, you really get defensive. And maybe you still feel that hurt. Regardless of how you find yourself experiencing pain right now or in your past, oftentimes we don't have much control over it when it gets introduced in our lives. And at this point in the story of Joseph, we can see he had a very crucial decision to make, and it is this. Am I going to be defined by my pain, or will I choose to allow God to still work through it? This is the same question many of us have to spend time asking and thinking about today. Whether we had control over it coming to us or not, the point is this. How we see our suffering matters. The lens that we use, okay? How we choose to view it. How we choose to experience it. You know, are you looking from a lens of, uh, what kind of lens are you looking at your pain and suffering through? Do you only see your life through the lens of the 78.79 years? Or do you see it through the lens of an eternity? You know, are you looking through a worldly perspective or a godly perspective? There's a big difference, right? So when Joseph was on his, own, on his way to Egypt, I believe this concept and this principle was one he had accepted and tried to meditate on. He didn't know exactly what was going to be on the other side of this enslavement, but he knew that he served a God who had the power to make the most of it and still use it for good. He knew that if he was willing to trust God every step of the way, he would gain a perspective of the Almighty in the middle of his pain. A godly perspective looks at pain and says, though this is where I am asked to start, this will not, this won't be where I finish. It won't be where I finish. I believe talk, uh, Paul talks about this concept in a different way in Romans 5. Romans 5, starting in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in, our, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he who has been given to us. So remember that passage in 2 Corinthians that Paul, he knew the suffering of this earth, of this world. But here Paul is telling us that even in our pain, it can lead to something that is great and something that glorifies God. But it has to begin with how we look at the pain. And how we face it in our lives and if we will trust in God's purpose and God's restoration. There's an illustration, I believe actually Pastor Matt used a few years ago, but it fits so well for what we're talking about today. And it's called Kintsugi. Some of you, probably, I think I'll probably butcher that, but you know, you get the point. So Kintsugi, and Ken, it, it means gold, right? And the Sugi part means joinery. So it literally means to join with gold, to join with gold. And there's some pictures of this that we have here. And so it's that Japanese art. They, take, they repair broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage in, with, uh, with lacquer that's dusted or mixed with powdered gold or silver or platinum. And it's just some beautiful things that they do. And since it's Christmas, we'll be here for a note. We even found one for Pastor Matt. It's right here. It's the, the striper one. 
Yes, I don't actually. I, they probably don't really make that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> However, but they take this broken pottery, right, and something that most people would look at, right? You, you broke something at your house, you're like, well, that's it. You sweep it up, throw it away. But they take this broken pottery that most people would say is worthless, and then they, can, they turn it into something even more beautiful than it was before. And I believe that is exactly what God does with us. God is in the business of looking at someone who is broken and seemingly worthless and turning them into something amazing and something that will glorify him. God takes what is ordinary. He makes it extraordinary all the time. God desires to heal you. He desires to restore you rather than punish you. I mean, yes, you can do some things and God might, you know, give you a little slap here, but he wants to restore you. He wants to heal you. He loves you, and he would much rather you be healed and restored than be separated him for an eternity. So maybe, but maybe you have come here today with a distorted view of yourself. I know I've had that for many years. It's still something I still struggle with today. My wife can tell you. That it is a fight every single day for me to look at myself the way God looks at me. So maybe every morning you look in the mirror and sometimes you look and you see someone that is broken that will never amount to anything significant. Maybe you have come in here believing that God's view of you is identical to your view of yourself. But I am here to tell you today that God sees you as so much more. He sees you as the restored person, as a person that he has put back together, right? He'll take that stuff. Just you pray, God, cry out, you know, Lord, just help me, you know, break me apart, put me together. And let me tell you, I prayed that prayer, and it hurts. You better be careful. You, you tell God, say, hey, I just need you to take me apart. He will do it. And it hurts at first, but then he'll put you back together and restore you and heal you. And it's because of the way he sees us that allows us to see everything, even our pain, through the lens of redemption and restoration. And this view of his situation and his God is what kept Joseph going in Egypt. So we're going to take a Cliff Notes version of this story, So just, just in case you're not familiar with it. okay? So remember, Joseph had been sold by his own brothers. And after he was sold in Egypt to Potiphar, who was employed as captain of the guard. Then Potiphar, he enjoyed Joseph's work. He put him in charge of the household. But then Potiphar's wife tried to get Joseph to sleep with her. When he refused, then she falsely accused him of him trying to have his way with her. Then Potiphar then removed Joseph as servant and sent him to prison. In prison, then Joseph found favor with the guards and was soon placed in charge of the other prisoners. He correctly interpreted the dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants. And then later he would stand before Pharaoh and interpret the king's dreams. When he did, Joseph was promoted from prisoner to prime minister overnight, and he served as second in command to Pharaoh. I mean, talk about a life of ups and downs, right? Just a big roller coaster with his life. But in all those moments, the moments when he was on a mountaintop, as well as in the valley of some kind, there was this common phrase, the Bible highlights throughout Joseph's story. And this is this. But the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. And because, because God was with him in the wilderness, it wasn't wasted. Which leads us to our next point. God does not waste our wilderness. The story of Joseph goes on to tell us that he was put in charge of the distribution of food throughout Egypt, as well as those coming from surrounding lands due to a great famine that had broken out. And on one particular day, Joseph's brothers came to gather food, and after recognizing it was him, they became fearful that Joseph would seek revenge. I bet they did, right? Like, oh, no. They probably, you know, they probably thought he was dead, or really probably didn't even fathom that they would see him again, right? But here's what the Bible says that happens. It's very near end of Genesis. It's Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. He says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive them. Forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. 
And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What an incredible testimony from Joseph's story. Frustration after frustration, he saw God's faithfulness instead. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Do you believe that for your life right now? Can the creator of the entire universe use your worst pain and suffering We're going to first look at verse 18. We're going to keep in mind the passage of Revelation that we looked at earlier. He says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Pastor Tony Evans says this about this passage. He says, Paul reminds us that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For believers... The glory ahead is not only greater than our present suffering, it will be so much greater that should we look back on our earthly existence from the joys of eternity, our only response will be suffering? What suffering? So keep reminding during our eternity with our Heavenly Father. So let's read verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God weaves everything together for good for his children. But here's the part that we have to kind of wrap our brains around sometimes, okay? So the good in this context, it doesn't refer to earthly comfort. The good is what is good from God's perspective. He works for our good according to his purpose. And so you may ask, what is God's purpose then? What is his purpose and his desire for our lives? Well, it's four things. That we are conformed to the image of Jesus. That we have a closer fellowship with God. That we bear good fruit for the kingdom of God. And then that final glorification. You know, often I believe that God will allow us to sit in a season of suffering or pain to get us to a place where we are solely, completely reliant on upon him and him alone because the one who knows us better our creator the one who knows us better than we know ourselves he understands that a close the closer our relationship is with him is better than anything else that we could possibly desire on this earth right and pull me in and draw me into him even if it's pain so that So when God is the center of our universe and we see things through that lens, our hope in what God has for us, it will overshadow overshadow any pain or any suffering that we may be going through. So we must learn to give thanks in all circumstances. You may be familiar with the story of Corrie ten Boom and her sister Betsy. The sisters found themselves in a German concentration camp in the midst of World War II. I think we have a picture of one of those... uh, the uh, barracks they had in there. They were assigned to an absolutely filthy barracks that happened to be infested with fleas. And as the sisters settled in, Betsy encouraged them to begin to thank God for everything that they had. Whether it be good or bad, they began thanking God for their situation. But until they got to the fleas, Corey simply could not bring herself to be thankful for the fleas But Betsy reminded her of their Bible reading earlier that day from 1 Thessalonians. Give thanks in every and all circumstances. Betsy encouraged her sister to be thankful for the fleas. So as the weeks pressed on, Betsy eventually found out that the German guards refused to come into their barracks because it was infested with fleas. The sisters had experienced incredible freedom inside their living quarters to share the gospel with others, encourage others, and to move about as the Lord had directed them. This was all because of the fleas. I asked the band to come up. I don't know exactly what kind of pain you have experienced. There's no way for me to know. In your past, right now, recently, 
I don't know what kind of wilderness you experience or what, what you're going through, the adversities you may have. But I do know this, that God is working for good. God is working it out for good. And we have to keep that eternal godly perspective through all the pain. And so you have to ask yourself, am I willing to believe that? Am I going to have the courage to believe that that's what he's doing? Are you willing to view this pain and this suffering through the lens of redemption and restoration? That God wants to not, he wants to heal your emotional pain and your emotional suffering. But sometimes we have to keep that that perspective that sometimes it's not about our earthly comfort, right? Sometimes this is just about getting us closer to Him. Sometimes it's about so He can get the glory. So what is God trying to teach you in the middle of your suffering? In Joseph's case, the initial pain he experienced brought him to a place where God was able to bless thousands of other people. Ultimately, God got the glory for all that was done through Joseph's season of pain. So what is God trying to make out of your current season? Whether you are on a mountaintop right now, a valley of some kind, or you feel like maybe you're just kind of wandering around in the wilderness, I believe God is able to use your season to not only bless you and others, but even receive glory for himself. But if you're willing to trust in him and his plan for provision and restoration, even if he sets you in the middle of the fleas. Okay? Let's all stand. And we're going to take a few minutes. And we're going to give you time to respond to whatever God is saying to you this morning. So if everyone could just close your eyes for a moment. This is not an emotional manipulation. This is to push away all the distractions, all the noise of your week, all the noise of this morning, just trying to, maybe just trying to get your family ready to come here. And praise God you made it. So I just encourage you to push away those distractions. Focus on your Heavenly Father. Lean into Him this morning and cry out and ask Him what it is He would have you do. Encourage to do His will even in the midst of your pain. So for the next few minutes, you can sing. You can pray where you are. The altar will be open if you would like to come here. Just be open to what the Lord has to say to you this morning. Have to do this morning. Okay. So we'll just take a few moments and sing together and pray.